My name is Brittany Beeler. I work at Blank Park Zoo, which is in Des Moines, Iowa, and I am a carnivore pinniped keeper. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the season five premiere of the Raw Safari podcast. Woo! Y'all, I am so excited to be back for season five after my zero week break. Okay, I know, I know it's a little silly, but it is the start of the fifth year of the Raw Safari podcast. And of course, that also means it's National Zookeeper Week in the United States because I purposely launched this podcast during National Zookeeper Week, and it's the same week every year, and that's how time works. So I am really, really excited to be starting this next season with uh, today's episode. So I mentioned in Zoo News last week, if you haven't heard it, make sure you go back and listen, what some of the changes for this season are going to look like, and I'm really excited about them. Uh, I'm not going to rehash them here, but uh, there's going to be a lot of exciting stuff happening this year, and I am, I'm so stoked. I also have set up some absolutely incredible and unique and exciting interviews. I am... I am losing my mind. I have stuff booked all the way through October at this point, y'all. That's that's impressive. I don't usually work that far out, but things have been happening and good things are coming and I cannot wait to share them with y'all. But one of those good things you're not going to have to wait for because it is today's interview. I have always tried to pair the season finale and the debut of the next season uh, with a, a kind of combination where I tried to get someone who I think is very special and well known in the industry for one of them. And then somebody who is very special, but maybe isn't as well known, you know, for the other one. So over the last couple of weeks, I was trying desperately to figure out who I wanted to be the person who would launch season five. Who should I interview? And as I was thinking about it, I went back to my interview, mentally at least, with Elizabeth Johnson and Brittany Beeler. You know... I had a blast with Brittany, which is pretty amazing, honestly, considering Elizabeth and I are such good friends. Uh, I I really loved everything that Brittany had to say, and I I really think that an interview with her would, would be incredible. Not to mention that she's at Blank Park Zoo, a facility we haven't had on the podcast yet. So I reached out to Brittany, and we got the proper approvals, and uh, now you're going to get to listen to that chat. And y'all... It is so much fun. We go all over the place. There is a long talk about internships and whether they should or should not be paid and and the goods and bads, pros and cons of all of that. We talk about Wolverines, which seems, you know, apropos since this is dropping on Tuesday and then Deadpool and Wolverine is dropping on Thursday. That was a complete coincidence. These are the, um, the, you know, North American animals, not the Hugh Jackman Marvel character, but we do talk about him, which is a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, we also, of course, talk about the animals that she actually takes care of, too, and all that other good stuff. Those of you that have been around a while know that sometimes these interviews just become conversations, and often those are the most popular episodes. Well, get ready for one of those. And, uh, hey, before we get to it, a couple of quick reminders. First of all, don't forget that you can support the pod for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash rossafari. As a matter of fact, we're celebrating the uh, fifth season here with a brand new Red Panda level patron. Kevin Williams is not just a patron, but is now a Red Panda level patron, our highest level. And beyond that, I need to give him a shout out because y'all... Every single week, 
every single week, he actually sends me a digest of Zoo News. And, you know, he kind of normally keeps it to the Northeast where he's from, but occasionally throws in other stuff, especially about otters because he likes otters. And there's always positive messages and thoughts about episodes. It's, it's literally this like lengthy email. He does it every week. And y'all, I love that there are people in my world that, that do that for the podcast. It's that kind of thing is so cool. And so Kevin... Thank you for becoming a Red Panda level patron and thank you for, you know, the the weekly Zoo News things and also just for being you because you're a really, really good human. And uh, it means a lot to me that we have we've gone from, you know, you being a fan to you being a friend. It's very cool. So thank you for that uh, to everyone else. Don't forget that you can also follow along by going to at Rossafari on the socials at Rossafari pod on TikTok and uh, Rossafari dot com. And with all of that said, here is my interview with Brittany Beeler of Blank Park Zoo. Are there non-carnivorous pinnipeds? <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid. <laughs> we have an interesting kind of blend where um, we do the seals and sea lions. We also do the great cats, but then um, we have primates and penguins as well as otters so we're a little bit of everything <laughs> okay that's interesting so i i volunteer at aquarium of niagara now and the the one team the team that i volunteer on is mmb which is marine mammals and birds so we oh, do yes. pinnipeds and penguins but mm. but um wow you're throwing in a lot of other stuff <laughs> there yeah so um it works out because we do all the water and all the fish so that's why we keep penguins um and then the group used to be carnivore primates so then with that transition we just kind of kept some of the primates so um i think it'll change in the future but for right now we just have a fun variety <laughs> i mean that's awesome i i think you know i would want the variety of species whenever whenever possible oh yeah i started off my career as a swing keeper so i love to jump into different routines and learn different things and i'm a big sucker for um, lemurs as well which we have on our team so it definitely suits all of the boxes for me. <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. And we will talk more about that. But yeah, tell me how you got into this. You said you started as a swing keeper, but like, did you know you wanted to be a keeper when you were growing up? And what was your education like? All that stuff. Um, yeah. So I went to Ohio Wesleyan University, which is a small um, private college in Ohio. And I decided to major in zoology. I did not know what I wanted to do. And everybody just kept saying, are you going to be a zookeeper? And I was like, no, I'm going to do something bigger and better and crazy. Um, turns like out there that... are many things that are bigger, <laughs> better and crazier than being a zookeeper and working right. with awesome exotic animals. Exactly. Come on now. <laughs> exactly. I definitely was like, no, that's too. I don't know. I don't know what I thought about it, but I had never really thought about it. So I um, had graduated and I decided to do an internship at the Columbus Zoo. Um, I'm originally from Ohio, so my roommate was doing an internship. We had both worked in guest services for a while um, doing this thing called basically a zoo crew where you go around and just talk to people. So it really helped with my interview skills later. So highly recommend. Nice. But, <laughs> um, I started on their North America team cause I'm a big sucker for native wildlife. Um, and first day got to feed our geriatric grizzly bear, ginger, cosequin and yogurt on a spoon to get her her meds. And I instantly was like, I want to do this. <laughs> Um, sign me up for this job. So um, through that internship, I got to work with a lot of different. <laughs> I watched that happen. That was your cat jumping up oh on that God. ledge and not quite making it. No, and he just knocked over a ton of plants. Oh, buddy. I'm going to move them real quick. Yeah, take take your time. <laughs> My husband's going to awesome. be so upset because those are his plans. Oh, no. <laughs> that was really awesome from my perspective, though. And I'm totally okay. leaving that in the episode. That oh, is perfect. not getting I'm glad out. you got to witness it because I just got to hear it. <laughs> yes. No, I, I like I literally was like, I don't want to interrupt her. But her cat is now up on that. Leg, like just looking cute. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was going to be like, kitty. And then I was crash. And I was like, That's oh, fine. yes, he has tried earlier and he made it. So I'm a little <laughs> disappointed in him. <laughs> but um. Yes. Anywho, um, yes, got to work with native 
wildlife. So that include trumpeter swans, uh, wolverines, which are one of my favorites. Oh my um, gosh. Pause cougars. right there. Nope. Pause <laughs> right there. We need to talk about your experience with, with wolverines because wolverines are just incredible. Uh, they're amazing. Um, they are one of the cutest animals I've ever seen in my life. Yes. And I think that they get a bad rep just because, I mean, their, their name is like Gillo Gillows. So it's like fat, fat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, their scientific name doesn't give them a lot of like leeway. It's kind of like gluttony, like, you know, um, and they do, they do do that, but they are, um, one of the biggest weasels. So they are very high energy, similar to if you've ever worked with, um, otters or black footed ferrets or just domestic ferrets, uh, very high energy. So they are a really cool animal. They are very hard to build trust with, um, but the trust is a great reward. Um, the culprit that I thought I got out is actually. Right oh, there is the cat. There is the cat that got that caused trouble. This is amazing. I, I kicked out everybody else. But he, <laughs> he hid in here. <laughs> amazing work. So you so you're an animal care professional and yes. you are very. Wait, OK, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I got everyone out, but he snuck back. He definitely he's black, so he can hide pretty right. easily in here. But... I just love that. It's the one who caused the trouble that got <laughs> was booted. The one that I didn't I'm get out, so yeah. happy. Oh. We'll just see. We'll just see if he'll chill for the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That works. But yes, Wolverines are amazing. Um, very intelligent. Um, Alvar is my first Wolverine breed that I worked with. Um, it's kind of a little known thing in the zoo world, but North American wolverine population wasn't super sustainable. So most of the wolverines that you see in captivity are actually European wolverines. So um, Alvar came to us uh, at the Columbus Zoo in 2014, and or actually he came there earlier. In 2014, they got their female in um, guillotine. Unfortunately, she is passed, but Alvar was such a sweet boy and I loved working with him for the little time that I had. Um, but yeah, Wolverines are amazing and I definitely recommend everybody go appreciate them. <laughs> yeah. They are one of those species that every time I see at a zoo and I go to Columbus a lot and I, mm -hmm. I like run over there and the, it's, it's often very hard to see them there. Um, but I, elusive, I just, yeah. yeah, I love that when they walk, they like, they lope. Mm -hmm. you know yeah and they I, just look awkward <laughs> yeah and i think i've said this before but they kind of make me think of they're they're like the american tazzy they're they really yeah. are you know and i think i don't know i just i find them fascinating they are such cool animals and so elusive and just i don't know i love that zoos are starting to represent them a little bit more um we're building that program with the small carnivore tag actually so um the program leader is really pushing for them and it's awesome because they're a great species. I love stuff that you can find in your own backyard for the most part. But, right. Um, yeah, but wolverines, cougars, um, wolves, bears, all that awesome stuff that we have here. So it was an awesome experience. And I ended up um, trying to get on to another internship after that. Um, took a little pit stop to <laughs> work at an artificial insemination lab after college for bulls. So that was different. Yeah, <laughs> that would be different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Realized that lab life is not for me, though it might be for some other people. Um, very interesting experience, but ended up getting another internship at a small private zoo called Tiger World that is in Rockwell, North Carolina. Um, and it's kind of a, it was poorly managed when it started and then um, it was shut down and then somebody else took it over, renamed it really built it up and it's a nice educational hub for the people in that community. Um, got to work with a lot of big cats, which was super fun. Um, really gained my appreciation for them and um, had to, had to butcher chickens, which was a little rough, but you know, really solidified that carnivore keeper life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then my final internship was down in um, Fossil Rim, which is Love in Glen Oaks, Fossil Texas. Rim. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Um, got to work with their wild canids there. So I got to work with red wolves, Mexican gray wolves, and then also maned wolves, which are some of my favorites. Um, Blackfooted cats, cheetahs, and kawadi. So it was a really nice mix. And then I ended up getting my first full-time job after that, which is where I started as a swing keeper. Nice. Very yeah. cool. That's quite the journey. It's definitely um, pretty typical, I think, of most people that work in the field. It's hard to stay in one spot just because there's not a zoo 
around the corner if you end up leaving one. And um, yeah, so it's been quite a journey of traveling. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. The first job. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so I, I'm curious what your take is. Um, you know, there's a big movement right now. Um, and I want to be clear, we're speaking, you know, clearly for you, not for the zoo or any anything else. Um, but there's a big movement right now about moving away from unpaid internships and saying that internships are kind of uh, a hard barrier to overcome to a to a job in the field. And you worked three of them. And I'm not great at math, but but that seems like three jobs where you're maybe not getting paid or not getting paid well. Mm. Um, I that seems like a lot. So do you have any thoughts or feelings about that and about the kind of movement that that some people are pushing for away from that? Um, yeah, so my first internship was not paid. My second two were, but um, I will say that it was mostly paid in housing. And then my first, the Tiger World one was $50 a week, which is not very much. Uh, and <laughs> Thank then, you for clarifying. <laughs> for clarifying, it is not very much. And then Fossil Rim was housing and uh, 300 a month. So still, you know, pretty tough. Um I think it's great that people are going to get paid for internships because you are getting paid um, to learn and actually be able to accomplish things in the field. You are kind of on the job training. So if you were doing that for other careers, such as electricians, you get paid for that, the apprenticeships and things. So um, I'm super supportive of internships becoming paid. I know that that makes it very tough for zoos. Um I know currently at Blank Park, we do not pay our interns. A lot of our interns are from um, still in school, so they still have housing. They don't have a ton of bills, things like that. Um, but I do know that it's very tough. So it becomes an issue of how available is this field inclusivity wise to everybody. Um, and definitely the zoo field is kind of transitioning into being a little bit more affordable, but um, no one's in this career to be rich, definitely. So um, it's hard because it's definitely a career that is based on your passion instead of you making a ton of money and, you know, getting a mansion somewhere. Um, I'm very fortunate because I have a dual income household. So um, I know a lot of people are in that position. And that is definitely an, a leg up when you're in the zoo field, if you do have a partner or somebody else that helps you with bills. Um I have seen a lot more zoos transitioning to increasing pay for cost of living because um, often zoos kind of forget that, you know, inflation goes up. But um, a lot of a lot of places that I've heard are kind of switching to either unions or doing more of the cost of living kind of analysis in the area and then doing their pay rates. Uh, Blank Park Zoo did that a few years ago and was able to increase all of our pay um, and then are giving us like cost of living percentage raises, which is nice. Um, but other facilities that can't afford that, it's unfortunate because they're just not going to be able to retain the kind of workers that you want to be able to build your company. And I think that people are starting to transition into that where you need to have those higher pay rates to get the experience that you want. Um, otherwise, you're just always going to be starting from the ground up when you're built, bringing in new keepers. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree very much. I, um... Yeah, I I feel like uh, it's one of many industries. And I mean, obviously, I love it. I'm doing this, you know, for <laughs> free for many years now. Um, but uh, I I think it is an industry that that has a reckoning coming that has already started. But like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know of anyone that is not supportive of <laughs> having interns be paid, um, especially just being able to get them in and get those experiences. I was fortunate enough during my first internship, 
even though I wasn't being paid, I worked full time. So my schedule was really crazy, but I found it to be worth it and I was able to work it out. Um, but other people that don't have that ability to do that, or if they are, you know, they have kids, they have responsibilities. Um, it's just not a super open field to certain people, depending on um, their abilities or their financial situations and things like that. So I do think that there's a big change coming. And I think that most people in the field are pretty supportive of that. I just know that finances can be tough because zoos are nonprofits for a reason. You're not, you're funneling it all back into your business. So um, paying interns and getting that kind of stuff in um, definitely is going to take a little bit of a hit on zoos, but I think it's a, a hit that needs to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. I've also, you know, uh, with all due respect to some of the incredible leaders at, at these facilities, um, I've, I've seen, you know, the public uh, salaries between management and keepers sometimes. And I, I think there can be um, a little bit of a, a reckoning there without having to pull money from other places, you know. So. Yeah, and I, again, not everywhere, but not there as are places. With that, but right. yes, there there definitely is a large gap depending on your position, um, and it's always not. It doesn't always consider the experience or like the talent that you're bringing, just kind of whatever your position title is, which I think is a mistake for sure. I think that certain people that you hire are going to be bringing different things to the table, and they should be compensated for that. But. Um, yeah, I am not in one of those big, tall positions, so I hope that there will be positive change. But I think kind of forcing that from AZA to only post paid internships and really push for paid internships is a step in the right direction for sure. Yeah, I, I'm really excited uh, when I when I heard about that. I thought that was really, really good. And then I thought it was interesting that immediately the date got moved back. There was that much pushback mm -hmm. against it, um, at least in the short term, like just in adapting new programs and stuff, which I understand. I, I can respect. But um, yeah, it, it's it's been interesting to watch all of that. But uh, I, I think they're also trying to get away from zoos relying heavily on interns to function. So um, because some smaller zoos definitely you're basically having those people be full-time keepers yeah. um, and they're not getting paid. So I think they're really trying to, AZ in general is really trying to push away from that and make it so that you have to be sustainable. The interns are here to learn and gain knowledge in the field. They're not just here to, you know, do the dirty work. Yep. Also, I, I personally, while I'm, while we're on this kind of deeper subject, um, I just, I am really passionate about leadership. Uh, I have spent, a lot of time studying leadership and kind of developing my own style from the various things that I've read and stuff. And um, I'm a big believer in uh, upside down leadership or, um, uh, you know, Leaders Eat Last is this incredible book that that really influenced me a lot. And the, the basic idea is exactly what it sounds like, which is that, you know, the the people who are higher up and who are getting paid more and who are getting all of that stuff are the ones who should do a lot of the nastier work when the ability is there. Obviously, if you're in a, you know, in a big time meeting, then you can't go and shovel poop like we all get that. Um, but I, I have seen at many facilities, you know, a lot of punching down kind of where it's like, all right, well, we got an intern so we can make them do the grossest thing and the worst thing and stuff. And I think if if people learned a little bit more about leadership and and how to not you know, go down that road, then um, it would make it a little bit easier to be less paid to be, you know, there, there are people who I've talked to who are literally like, oh, this is the grossest part of my job. So who, what volunteer can I voice this on? What intern can I voice this on? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. That's just bad for retention. You know? Yeah, it really is. And I really follow the philosophy that like, hey, if I wouldn't do it, I'm not going to make an intern do it. <laughs> I'm getting paid to do it. And if it's something that I find super disgusting, um, I recall heavily in my first job, we would have to clean out drains in our um, kangaroo and wallabies and eh, very <laughs> gross. <laughs> that could have been my story for later. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like I would never have an intern do something that I find like I detest doing. Um, and it's because what are you learning from that? Except that like you are then the punching bag, similar to what you said. Um, our intern program at Blank Park Zoo has gotten a lot better in the past few years where we are really focused on teaching and having them learn and 
following keepers, having them ask questions. Uh, very similar at Columbus when I was an intern there. We had these little tests that you had to go and ask keepers or you had to go and like search the zoo. And we had, um, Columbus has a, I'm not sure what the internship program is now, but when I was there, it was very good. You had talks teaching you about SSPs, teaching you about different programs, teaching you about enrichment. Um, we would have projects where we watched enrichment and rated it. Um, so I think some of those bigger zoos that have the resources can really make those internship programs really special. Um, when I interned in Fossil Rim, it was really cool because I was basically a full-time keeper. Um, and yeah, I did not get the compensation of one, but it really showed <laughs> me that I could have independence. I could, I am ready for that next step. So I think you have to find a even ground within that because a lot of internships are very hands-off where you're not giving them independence, but then you don't want to give them too much independence because, you know, they haven't learned all that yet. So um, I, it's it's tough, but I almost think you need to like figure out what your intern is needing or where their level is and then be able to instill them with certain independence so that when they do take on that full time job that they are not just waiting for someone to tell them what to do because that transition is tough. Oh, just, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, being a kind of keeper during the internship at Fossil Rim, I feel like I had a little bit of a leg up in my first job of being able to take on projects, um, be independent. But a lot of other people that just do straight internships where you're being like watched all the time, you're not really set up to do things. I think that transition could be a little bit harder. But I was very fortunate with the path that I took that I felt very independent in my first job. So um, yeah, internships are tough. I think a lot of zoos are trying to push toward what are what are we hoping that they get out of this at the end and definitely taking the feedback getting more information from them and then being able to per, kind of push that into the next realm of how do we do better next time so there is some good change but it is tough with some of the smaller zoos are definitely going to have more of the pushback where they just can't afford to um pay them or they will not be able to post on aza anymore which is good but also it's a bummer for those that are just trying to get by. So it makes them have to reevaluate what they're doing, which I think is good. A lot of people have been floating by just with their former stuff. Like we've been good before. This is what we do. So it's nice to see that they're, you know, being held accountable for things that we should be pushing for betterment in the community itself. Absolutely. I mean, we're always pushing for better standards for the animals mm -hmm. and humans are animals too. <laughs> exactly. We got to take care of our staff so that our staff take care of our animals for sure. Um, it's a big cycle. Yeah. And I thought it was super interesting that you mentioned that, um, uh, you know, the, the better internships and the better programs are the ones that kind of like figure out the individual human and what they need and then work one on one with them. Because what does that sound like to me? Well, every good training program ever, right? We always say training is the study of one and you build those relationships and you, you know, we know the species standards, but then we get to know the individuals and we work with them as they are and as they need. And uh, I feel like, um, you know, I mean, an internship is literally training a human to do a job. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I feel like this field, the people that I see be the most successful in this field are the ones who equate their training and, and compassion for their animals to their humans as well and vice versa. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Definitely. And you definitely have the other side of it, too, in leadership roles. Um, but I think in this field, to be the most successful, you need to look at things through the same way that you look at your animal care. What are we enrichment? They only have what we give them in their environment. If we're not supplying interns with a positive environment, what are they going to leave that? 
thinking or, hey, we're not giving them enough enrichment in their environment. Why don't we, you know, show them videos, teach them about certain things, give them opportunities to learn on their own. You know, um, I think that building that is super important. And I do believe that most zoos are leaning toward that. And some of the bigger zoos have already figured it out, but luckily they have more manpower to be able to do that. But um, my experiences with internships were pretty good. I mean, I was definitely unpaid labor, but I did learn a lot. And I definitely would recommend doing internships because that's a really great way to be in the field. But I was fortunate enough with the internships that I had that I felt confident going into the field and I was able to reach my goal before um, I was 24. So I wanted to be in the field at 23 and I got my first job before then. So that was really exciting. Nice. That's very cool. So, all right. Uh, I, you know, this is why I never uh, like write out um, questions or anything because who knew we would go on a 17 minute deep dive on internships and the state <laughs> right? of the field. That Something was I'm passionate not the about, plan. Man. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that so much though. That's really cool. Um, so, okay. So, but, uh, you know, whenever I go off the animal stuff for too long, I always start to get nervous that, that my, my listeners are going to throw <laughs> rotten tomatoes at me. So, um, let's talk about some animals that you currently are working with. And just, I, I have a huge love of pinnipeds right now. Mm. I spend a lot of time I'm with them. And um, so so tell me about your pinnipeds. Yes. Yeah, so um, currently right now we have two female sea lions, California sea lions, and then we have one male harbor seal. We are actually doing a capital campaign at Blank Park Zoo where we are going to be doing saltwater filtration and redoing our holding building. So our kiddos are going to be shipped to another zoo after the summer. So we are not looking to get any more Um, kiddos, even though we have the room until our renovations are done. So um, we're super excited about those renovations. They will be amazing, but we're going to be sad when our kids leave. Um, Ross is the main pinniped that I train. Um, It's a long process, as I'm sure you're kind of aware, to build trust with between um, you and your animal, especially with pinnipeds. They are so smart. They will try to get away with things. (laughs) They will haze you almost when you're new. Um, So I have been working with Ross for a little over a year, um, really building in that relationship. He still tries to pull some over on me, but um, (laughs) I I take it with grace for the most part. There's definitely days where I leave where I'm pretty frustrated because I was like, you know better than this. But at the same time, you know, that's it is what it is. (laughs) But right now we do training demos. And we do um, demonstrations with our seal and sea lions, and we do an educational talk for about 10 minutes. Um, there, we kind of transitioned it out of a show. We definitely don't want to use the word show most of the time because then people expect certain things from it. Like um, sometimes Ross will just leave. Like he just doesn't want to participate, yeah. especially later on in the demos. So, um, <laughs> and sometimes our sea lion's a little goofy, but I feel like the implication of a show is that like something big's going to happen. And sometimes it doesn't because it is all voluntary. And if they don't want to do it, then we're just left standing there being like, okay. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, so we do a training demonstration. Um, we, kind of highlight a lot of how we build training behaviors, which I think is a really cool aspect. Our supervisor and our assistant director of animal care reworked our script uh, two years ago. So it's a lot less show and a lot more education, which is something I really enjoy. But we show like how we can do voluntary behaviors with them, showing us their mouths, showing their flippers, being able to do taction, so touching them. um, Because... Seals and sea lions are conscious breathers, which makes anesthetizing extremely difficult. Um, It can be done. It has been done at Blank Park as well as other places. It just is very nerve wracking because they are not going to just start breathing on their own. You almost have to like get them to do it. So we try to do as many voluntary behaviors as possible so that we do not have to anesthetize for anything. We do voluntary x-rays. We do voluntary ultrasounds. We are working on voluntary blood draws. We do voluntary injections. So a lot of the issues that you would rise with having to do a knockdown can be avoided, which is amazing with pinnipeds. They are so smart. Sometimes they pick it up in a session. Sometimes 
you know, it takes a few years. We have a ball balance behavior with one of our sea lions that she is so good. She can climb up on rocks now holding the ball. And I was like, yeah, that's been about like a three year process. So it doesn't just happen. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and certain things like our target behaviors, we show in the demonstration how to, how we shape behaviors through target, which is really cool. Um, I don't think a lot of people, some people just think that you just ask something and they do it. And it's like, that is not, <laughs> sometimes you can capture things, but most of the time you're really, really building into those behaviors and you have to be very considerate as to what criteria you want. Um, as I'm sure you've seen, sea lions have kind of a stricter criteria for their behaviors. So um, it's, kind of about making sure that they are in the correct position. We are working in free contact with dangerous animals. So we want to make sure that everything is on cue on, you know, the level that we want so that they know what to expect from us. And then we can, you know, in turn, know what to expect from them. So um, Zoe, our sea lion that does most of our demos, she is adorable. She is fun. She actually, all of our animals are rehabbed. So she came in with fully mature cataracts in both of her eyes after she was stranded at about a year old. So um, they did cataract surgery at Blank Park with outside help and was able to give her her vision back, which is amazing. And um, Ross actually came in, same thing, stranded with eye issues, but has a high infinity for people, which means that he is not a good candidate <laughs> to go back out. No. Um, he likes the interaction. So I said in another life, he should have just been a sea lion. He's definitely <laughs> that kind of energy. And then our last girl is Meatball. She came in um, <laughs> trying to just blaze over that. Miss Meatball. <laughs> Such dignified names, and then you get to her. <laughs> um, Meatball is our youngest sea lion. She came from the Pacific Ma Marine Mammal Center, the rehab center, and she was not considered competitive enough when diving and hunting for food, so they didn't feel like she would be successful. I think she personally worked the system because she's a little crazy girl, so I think that they probably... She probably would have been fine, <laughs> but um, she's only five. So she's starting her training journey. Um, so she's just really excited. She runs to everything and she's like super amped. So it's really fun to see her, but she just needs to slow down for some of the behaviors because it starts to get a little out of control. But um, all of our kiddos have been really fun to work with. Uh, we do behind the scenes tours as well, where you get to kind of meet them and us a little bit more. And we get to talk to you about all of their training. And every time people are blown away by how much work that we put in and just the amazing effort that um, zoos in general put in that the average viewer would not necessarily see. So we love the behind the scenes tours as well. Yeah, I think, um, especially with pinnipeds, going behind the scenes is one of those things where you can just really connect with them. Mm -hmm. And um, and like you said, come to understand the hard work that goes into it. Because you're right, one thing that I have reached the conclusion of, and this is purely anecdotal, but it's based on a lot of evidence. I spend, one of the things I do at the aquarium is I spend a time up uh, during the sea lion presentations um, at the nets, kind of like making sure that people don't throw stuff in the pool and, and stuff. And a lot of people talk to me and I hear a lot of people talk. And I genuinely think most people think like if they thought about it, they wouldn't think this. But I think it goes through their brain that um, that that pinnipeds speak English. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like you said that literally that like when you're like, you know, you you use a cue and and you say, you know, whatever it may be nuzzle for for the little kiss behavior I know is, is what we use that they're just like, oh, now I need to nuzzle her face. And then they do it. And uh, yes, for everyone listening, I just did it to my microphone. So um, <laughs> this is why it's audio only for this podcast. But anyway, um, uh, and, and that's just not the case. Like that word doesn't mean nuzzle to them in the sense of like they speak English. And I again, I know you know this. I'm speaking to my audience. <laughs> um, but, you know, you just like you said, it's it's a behavior that's put on a cue and that can take a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. um, I do think with pinnipeds in particular. I think out of all the species I've spent time with, they're the ones that it's hardest to remember that they are dangerous wild animals yes, because a adorable mm -hmm. b 
playful, most of them that I have met at least. Yeah. And then C, because they're usually so well trained, I mean, assuming y'all are doing the job correctly, you know, I have no issue getting down and and getting a nuzzle from a sea lion. And mm-hmm. I remember when I was at Wildlife World, they were like, okay, do you want the kiss on your cheek or on your mouth? And I was like, mouth, <laughs> obviously. And I'm sitting here with this wild animal right up to my mouth. And um, we even did this thing where we started with it like facing to the side. And then when they gave the cue, we both turned and like kissed and it was adorable it's so cute but there's no way like i'm thinking in that moment like this is this is a well-trained but dangerous animal although the the flip of that i suppose is although they are domesticated which is different but uh you know i mean i do the same thing with my black lab and she could tear my face off if she wanted to yeah Um, I think the other thing that people forget about sea lions is, um, since you got kissed on the mouth by one, I was going to talk about their dental stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. Black teeth. Yes. Oh God. They're so (laughs) Um, gross. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, they have a lot of bacteria in their mouth. So if you happen to get bit, it's not even that the bite is bad, but that bacteria, you will get a infection. (laughs) Yes. So you are a trooper for getting kissed on the mouth. (laughs) I have always said, I will, I, I genuinely believe that the way that my life will end is by being the guy who's like out in the woods or something and knows how to handle what happens if there is an angry bear or something and have, has done all the reading and understands the species and thinks, well, but not it's me. I mean, <laughs> they love animals, love me. And that, that'll that probably my, be my last words followed by, ow, 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 oh, crap. <laughs> Wait, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. No, you're a trooper for doing that. I know that um, the first time I got kissed by a sea lion, my friend was training and they gave him a nice juicy squid before I got the kiss. So I had the little bit of the residue on my cheek, which was... <laughs> I was like, this is still amazing, but I find this a little disgusting at the same time, which is kind of just a wrap through zookeeping, really. This is amazing, but a little disgusting. Yes. Yeah. That's been my entire podcast experience with this stuff as I'm like, I cannot believe I'm having this experience. And by that, I both mean meeting this incredible animal and also what my hand is in right now. I know. Oh, and there's goobers coming down my face, you know, just like... They're like, oh, lions are a lot oily than you think. And then when you're doing a knockdown, you touch them and you're like, whoa, <laughs> it's like, that's disgusting. But oh, my God, I just touched a lion. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, 100 percent. When I was coming up, I had the most sensitive stomach, in particular when it comes to smells. smells could set me off. One of the funniest things in the world to me is that I, uh, you know, a big part of what I do at the aquarium is prepping diets when I'm there and I'm working, like you said, with with the squid and and I don't even eat seafood. So I don't even, I don't like the smell of seafood. I don't Mm -hmm. like any of it. It all grows me out. When I was growing up, if my parents or grandparents made me go to a seafood restaurant and they would, they, they loved them. The smell alone was enough that it would trigger me to vomit multiple times, like multiple oh, times. No. I would say literally multiple times a year. The, the 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 image was me sitting at a table trying to eat some chicken, feeling gross out, starting to gag and yeah. taking off, running to the bathroom, vomiting. And now wow. I'm handling squid like it is my job and like grabbing them and like tossing them into, you know, oh, got to make sure that my sea turtle friend gets one. Again. And I'm like, yeah. what happened? And like, <laughs> yeah, all of the lions are, are gross. I've, I've encountered them as well. And some of yeah. the smells from when you're meeting Ooh. these animals are just insane. <laughs> and I'm like, how is the guy who literally a restaurant was enough to make him vomit <laughs> now standing here and breathing deeply and being like, this is awesome. Fusa smell horrible but like they i'm do, with the yeah. fusa <laughs> <laughs> i um definitely when we walk into our cat building on certain days your eyes just water <laughs> and it's because there's so much ammonia and you're like it's fine because like that's an involuntary response but i'm like yeah it smells pretty bad in there and it's like well you're crying i was like yeah i can't make my eyes make this okay <laughs> I go a little nose blind, but not not in those mornings. That is rough. I'm definitely nose blind to fish now, which is pretty wild. And the more you work with something, the more it just doesn't bother you. Like, I never thought I was like, oh, my gosh, marine mammals. Absolutely not. And then I 
was like, hey, this position's open. I'm going to maybe learn something new. And I really enjoy working with pentapeds. I don't know if I have the long-term love that a lot of people do. I definitely um, de definitely go more toward like our big cats and primates. But um, yeah, I've definitely gained a new appreciation for them and the amount of training that it takes for them. It has been an awesome experience just to learn and gain more experience training um, just because most people are self-taught with training. So it was a really cool way to bring a new challenge into that, that I wouldn't necessarily have with primates or big cats. No, definitely. Yeah. I, I could talk, I mean, clearly I can and <laughs> am talking pinnipeds all day. Of course. Um, yeah, no, I, okay. But because I, you know, we have other animals to talk about and you're literally like, these are the animals I work with that I'm the least passionate about and no, I can't that's shut not up. What so. I mean. <laughs> No, I know. I just think it's funny that I'm like, okay, I'm asking you about the stuff that you're like, okay, can we can we get to the cats, please? Can oh, no, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a big carnivore person, so of course the sea lions fit in there, but they, I would say in general, they're the least amount of my experience because right. it's just been the last two and a half years working with them. Um, but yeah, they're amazing, and it's so funny because I feel like I talk about sea lions all day, every day with the demos, talking about, you know, educating people during keeper chats and whatever, so then I'm kind of like, I want to talk about the other stuff <laughs> <laughs> all right well then let's do that let's let's transition to some of the other carnivores that you're working with so you can you can take the lead tell me about some animals <laughs> um so if um if some of you remember my voice from before i run the fusa ssp program Woo! so um they're obviously very close to my heart but um currently i work at a zoo that does not have fusa so um i would say probably lemurs are my favorite um i love any kind of lemur you can throw at me, I am down for it. Um, they are, they're different than other primates because they're just a simpler primate, which I, I don't know what that says about me that I just like really like them if I <laughs> just prefer the simple stuff. But um, the real question is not what it says about you, but what it says about your husband. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. Maybe he's like, I married a lemur. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I love lemurs. I also. So love wait, hold on a second. What kind of what kind of lemurs do y'all have? At, yes, at the zoo? we have ringtail and black and white ruffs right now. Oh, nice. I've also worked with red ruffs. Um, but I, I could just live in a building full of lemurs and be completely happy. Uh, just a Madagascar. I, you know, Omaha has that whole Madagascar yes. run. And I'm like, I'm super jealous. I want to I wanna live in a building like that. Um, but we have those types of lemurs right now. Um, we also have tiger, snow leopard, and lion as our big cats. And then, like I said, we hang out with penguins, Magellantic penguins, and we also do the river otters. So uh, river otters are something I've worked in every single position that I've been in, and I love river otters. They're so fun. Nice. They're also a fun type of weasel, so they're smelly. Um, <laughs> they really are. They're stinky. They have some of the grossest poop I've probably ever seen besides... Um, Bear. Bear poop is pretty rough, too. Yes. <laughs> but um, they're super fun. They're crazy. They're super smart. They're tenacious with enrichment. It's amazing. Um, they remind me a lot of FUSA, actually, with just the challenges that you can provide for them. And yeah, big cats are always awesome, but I feel like they always get all the credit. They're always the ones that are soaking it in. So I like to talk about the small carns, too. But um Right now, we only have red pandas, which are amazing. But I, I was going to say, I, I could literally see your face as you started to say only have. And we're like, oh, I'm about to get yelled at. <laughs> I know they're your favorite, but we do have red pandas and we have river otters. And those are the only small carns we have currently. Um, we are hoping to expand that in the future. But I'm a big small carn person um, just because I think I mentioned to you that I host a web series as well just teaching about them. So um, big fan of those. So of course I always have to highlight that, but we have a very interesting section and I never thought I'd like penguins, but I have a favorite penguin now. And tell me about um, your favorite penguin. <laughs> his name is neon and he has bit me a few times, but that's they do that. we're working out our relationship, you know, um, he's a great dad. And that's what I think I love about him. Um, he is a nest building champ. Anytime that you give him materials, he has taken huge, like huge amounts to take back to his uh, partner, Pippi. And they are great parents. They raised two chicks recently. Um, also, when he eats, he does like the ASMR chewing 
when he like takes down the fish. So I think that that is that is one of my favorites. Wait, as well. wait, wait. Pause, pause. Okay, penguins don't chew fish. What are you talking about? They eat them whole. I'm I'm genuinely so confused no, right so now. So <laughs> it's kind of like a I I misspoke because they do not chew fish. It's like <laughs> when they're taking it down, it's like I don't know. It's like him just like working the muscles like the gobbling noise the okay, gobbling. okay yeah sorry not the chewing you I, you got me I, well and I, i'm not i'm not trying to be that guy i just <laughs> i i i've fed penguins of multiple yeah, species like, and i was like chew? did i miss something <laughs> <laughs> no it's just that gobble and it's just like because he'll come up put his little put his little beak on your leg he's just so sweet he's just like i will take it like the perfect gentleman so you can kind of just like put them in his mouth and he'll just like to get them down and it's so cute because it sounds like chewing but it's not um but it's just it's weird and I love it and I was like you are now my favorite penguin because you are so cute and you do all these fun things um <laughs> so yes I do have a favorite penguin now which I never thought would be a thing but same um, even when I started putting in time with them same I never thought I yeah, would have I'm a like favorite. they're super cool but yeah. I didn't think I'm not a big bird person and it's not anything about birds more than just um I like birds of prey i think i just like things that eat meat i don't know <laughs> um the lemurs are the weird exception i just like um i really like the meat eaters their diets are always super easy so i think that that was another thing and they're pretty highly motivated most of the time if they're opportunistic you can try out weird food with them so i think that just i love the meat eaters and it seems like that's just where my path has went i like the predators <laughs> i mean I'll, I'll i just judging by how vegans act online i think that's true for you know humans too. <laughs> i'm a bad person uh <laughs> it's a different kind of aggression it's because they're not getting the meat yeah <laughs> <laughs> so okay so um uh, you know i you, you mentioned otters and red pandas and obviously we have to talk pandas but i'm showing a lot of restraint here and and <laughs> we'll, we'll get there but if you're so passionate about otters what is it about them and again tell me about the individuals and stuff yeah so our current male his name is fisher he is a young male so he is just crazy <laughs> um <laughs> Otters are very busy. Even out in the wild, they're always hunting. They're always doing something. They're rolling around. They're playing. Um, in our current situation, we have two otters. Our other otter's name is Sassy. Ah! She is 19 years old, which is very old for an otter. Uh, and she Gosh. does not want to have a roommate who is a three-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> so um, right now, our otters are living in their own in their own apartments right now. Um so we definitely are excited for this capital campaign that I mentioned earlier. We are also building a new otter habitat. So we are very excited about that. It's going to be a lot more space and we'll hopefully have a breeding pair of otters. So Fisher will finally get a girlfriend. Um, and we're super excited for him because I'm sure he will just love, love having a buddy. Um, Sassy would, yeah, never want to hang out with him. She is fine being her old lady self. So. That seems to be a trend, too, with um, I've had older females with younger males and the older females are always like, get this young child away from me. Like, do not. They'll scream at them. <laughs> it's kind of like, OK, oh, let's, man. Uh, let's leave her alone. <laughs> that's but, really funny. I know yeah, one pair that's like that where it's an older male with a younger female. And that this is at Elmwood Park Zoo. And mm -hmm. I know they were kind of like, I don't know how this is going to go. And like, they are the most chill together. Like Piper's crazy yeah. and like runs circles around Rocky, but like, he's cool with it and he's fine. And it's he goes to sleep. The old ladies. And, yeah. They don't like that. It's the old men are like, okay, whatever young buck, like run around. But the ladies are like, no, I want to watch my stories and go to bed. <laughs> like get out of here. <laughs> That's so funny. So oh they're super gosh. fun. Um, really cool educational points. People can can see them in Iowa so that is a really cool I like being able to show people animals that you can see out in the wild I mean the first time I saw a porcupine out in the wild I think I cried and it's just because I never had seen one and I, he was about to lose it so anytime I see an animal that besides like squirrels and chipmunks you know mm. the, the stuff you see all the time um the first time I saw a badger actually like witnessed a badger my husband and I were both driving and we're like, oh, my God, we like pulled over the car because we were both like taking it in. Yeah. And uh, other people are like, yeah, we always see badgers. I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand. I've never seen a badger outside of um, 
the Henry Villa Zoo. <laughs> I, I think one of my favorite stories ever was I was at the Living Desert in mm. uh, Tucson, Arizona, and it's this beautiful facility. If you've if you've never been there. Um, no, the Desert Museum. I, I'm confusing the two. I was names. like the they Living have, Deserts in yes, California. Yes, in California. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. No, the yes. Desert Museum, which is mm. in uh, Arizona. And um, it's this huge naturalistic, uh, it almost doesn't even look like, you can barely see the fences half the time. And they have a lot of native species there. And they have a ton of coyotes. And I spent probably an hour watching these coyotes and was just blown away they're 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 big and they're beautiful (laughs) and they're goobers and so (laughs) oh yeah and so i'm driving away and i get like literally less than a mile away from the facility and all of a sudden trotting along the road next to me is a coyote and the coyote looked exact. I mean, if you told me it had just escaped from there, I would believe it. Obviously, it had not. But like, it looked, ex- you know, they all look kind of the same, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was just trotting along and it stopped and it looked at me and I had I pulled over to the other side and I also just sat in my car and we just looked at each other for a second. Yeah. And I was literally breathless. I It, it was like <laughs> the most magical feeling. And all I could think was I just spent an hour <laughs> with these same animals, but seeing one just just a mile away from the facility made me like, ah. I mean, the first time I saw a moose when I was in Alaska, I because I worked with moose a little bit at Columbus mm-hmm. in my internship and I just think they're really cool, but I forget how big they are. And then you're in your car and you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that thing is huge. And it's just like, I don't know. And I... I watched this horror. Sorry to uh, tangent for a second. No, I go watched for this it. horrible TV show called like <laughs> Moose, the most like dangerous predators or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what's this about? And it's about that they have such skinny legs that when like you hit them with your car, your airbags don't go off, but it like throws the whole <laughs> moose body into your car. Oh, no. So I've been like low key afraid of moose. <laughs> Because I was like, man, they're like the ultimate killing machines up in Maine and stuff. <laughs> but it's not how you expect. <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> I don't know. It's just this TV show. And I was like, you know, I love watching shows that have animals in them. Like, And I'm like, killing machines? Like, oh my gosh, I need to I need to know about this. Apparently, moose are out there murdering people. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And it was a... It was a long time ago. I cannot even remember what the TV show was called. Um, But yeah, it was about how if you hit them with your car, they'll like be okay sometimes, but they'll like slide up into your windshield and like just murder you. And I was like, wow, I've never been so afraid of moose in my life. (laughs) That is legitimately amazing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so I get it. Moose in the wild and coyotes and badgers and all that fun stuff. Like if I end up going to Madagascar, I will probably just like crumble to the ground and cry the first time I see a lemur or a fusa if I get the chance to see those elusive kiddos. (laughs) Yeah, that would be that would be incredible. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I um. I I desperately want to start doing more eco travel and like doing like mm-hmm. the Red Panda Network eco tour and stuff. Yes. And I, I, you know, even having spent time like behind the scenes with over 50 pandas now, I still think <laughs> I would melt down just seeing. One oh, yeah. Tree, you know? I mean, because yeah. what are the chances you're going to see it? Right. And then when you do, you're like, I'm witnessing nature in its purest form, you know, like yeah. it's it's a different it's a different view. And I I've worked with like Maine wolves and kinkachus and sloths. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if I ever saw any of those kids like out in Brazil, I would lose my mind. (laughs) (laughs) So it makes, it makes you a good adventure buddy. It makes you a good um, person, I think, to plan trips. Cause like I told my husband, I was like, we got to go to Madagascar. And he's like, okay, (laughs) yeah, "Yeah, all right. I got to figure it out, but we got to go one time. (laughs) Uh, We got to go cause I I need to go. Yeah, I feel like, uh, yeah, there's there's a whole lot of when people are uh, willing to do that kind of thing, you know, like if you're the, yeah, and who's going to say no to that? Like, right? who's gonna oh, be like, Madagascar, not. <laughs> could we go to like Disney instead, please? Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I, I married an adventurous soul, so he's typically down for those kinds of things. And I was like, I want to go to Brazil. I want to like see if if I saw a main wolf, I would just break down. I would never know what to do with my life. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'd be like, I have peaked. Like everything else from then on is not going to count. <laughs> fair, very fair. Um, so yeah, so uh, you know, since we're talking about all these lovely animals that we love so much, let's talk about my favorites. You have to tell yes, me about your pandas. pandas. Um, so we have two red pandas. Their names are Raz and. Um, you guys are so good with names. I like it so much. Raz, Raz. and Tudo, which Tudo means little potato. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, um, they are super cute. I don't work with them directly. They're on our small mammal team. But um, I recently brought my father-in-law and uh, my husband's family to come and do some behind-the-scenes stuff. And um it was it was amazing red pandas will bring a smile to anyone's face because they're just so darn cute um but they got to watch a training session and they got to help like feed the pandas and stuff and just the pictures that we took of them just living like the best panda life was my favorite um they're super interesting they're super interesting small carnivore which is weird that they're even in that group but um they're in there with us (laughs) And they are actually um, one of our signature species in the U.S. um, SSP population. So species survival plans, um, they are one of the signature ones, which is a nice distinction. It means that they are popular and sustainable in their populations, as well as they have good husbandry and um, some other factors such as demography, too. So that's really nice. Otters are also in that group, North American otters, because who doesn't love I think when I talked to our tag chair, I was like, how many zoos have otters? And he was like, uh, 200. And so I was like, I have 18. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So that's a nice little wake up call. (laughs) Everybody loves otters (laughs) and red pandas. Yes. Um, but yeah, they're super fun. They are pretty elusive at Blank Park. They have three areas that they can be in. Um, they have an outside exhibit, an indoor exhibit, and then they have this like downstairs breeding area. So sometimes they like to hang out in there. So people sometimes don't see them when they come. But um, we're working on potentially creating just an outside exhibit for them. So then they'd be much more visible. Um, but that is in the plans for some time, you know, yeah. zoo, zoo construction is always super slow. So, um, and it's always really expensive Yes, yes. <laughs> regardless of what, if you're putting in a sign, it'll be astronomically expensive. It's like how they upcharge you for weddings at a venue. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a zoo. Oh yeah. No, that's going to be twice what you thought it was going to be. Yeah, sad but true. Very cool. All right. So the last time that you were on here, like you mentioned, it was all about the SSP, the the FUSA or the FUSH mm-hmm. SSP. The FUSH. Yes, uh, which is still I think that's become my favorite fact to share with people. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I really like it. And like, it's one of those things that like I tell FUSA keepers that and they don't know it. And it makes me really happy. It's really funny because I like dug into a ton of research for that. And I was like, that's so weird. I've never heard that. Then I like, I checked it because I was like, this seems like somebody would just say this and this would be wrong. But no, it's actually consistent, which is funny. And then I recently saw it somewhere else and I was like, yes, confirmation. (laughs) I did not trick John. I was going to say, that is one of those things where now that you mentioned that, I'm like, I just trusted you. I've been telling yeah. everyone this. I just yeah. trusted. Yeah, I, I appreciate the just innate trust in me, but I, I did I did check it first. Good, 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 good. But so, yeah, so what's going on with the SSP? Any any new exciting things or, or yes. anything like that? Yes, so um, we do have two individuals coming over from England that are going to join our population, so we're really excited about that. Um, Uh, They will be creating breeding pairs over here. Um, We have two facilities that are attempting to breed. I don't know if we'll be successful this year. The breeding part was successful, but we don't know if pups will happen. Um, We are setting up, I want to say, four breeding facilities for next year. So hopefully our numbers will be good. Um, Our three pups down at Abilene are doing great, and they're about to hopefully move out in the fall to their new homes. Um, so we're super excited about that. I'm sure um, Lava Volo mom is ready for them to get the heck out of her hair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they just turned one, actually, uh, this month. So we were super excited about that. Um, we did have some individuals from non-AZA zoos that kind of appeared in our population. So even though I don't manage the non-AZA zoos, I do help out with, like, if they need breeding stuff or if they need help 
between non-AZA zoos, and we can also transfer them into AZA zoos depending on inspections and things like that. So um, I am definitely open helping whoever. I'm like, oh, you you want to do something fun with your FUSA? Yeah, like I will help you. So um, yeah, it's been good. We have been growing some other things. We have been um, highlighting FUSA a lot more with our Facebook page and um, the Small Carnivore Facebook page that started. Um, I am one of the admins for it, so I throw in the FUSA stuff whenever I can. <laughs> I'm a biased admin for sure. <laughs> We've also been doing a web series where I've been fortunate enough to highlight uh, two FUSA topics so far and hopefully going to put on more in the future. I am trying to spread the wealth, get every get every program on there so that we can really hit all of our kiddos. But our um, small kind of our group is really odd because it encompasses in a lot of different individuals that um, kind of have different husbandry. So we have like meerkats, which is a very important social dynamic. And then you have animals that can live in groups like otters. You can have brother duos with FUSA. And then you have like the solely solitary individuals, which can be FUSA wolverines. Um, so we have a big variety. And then you have the fish and wildlife side with black-footed ferrets of the re-release programs. So um a lot of variation, so it's been fun to do the web series just to um, kind of spread out the knowledge and just be like, hey, just this is working for us. Like you could, it's pretty transferable for the most part. So um, that's been really cool to kind of understand more of the small carnivore groups. Um, but FUSA has been good. We have been um, pushing. I am <laughs> most annoying, probably, program leader. And I'm like, hey, you're from so-and-so zoo. Have you ever thought about FUSA? Let me tell you why they're amazing. So I am always promoting for them. But we've had some awesome interactions. We've had some great um, building. We are building up the program, adding more advisors, getting more engagement. So we um, have small numbers now, but I think in the future we are we are going to be able to boost that up, which I'm super excited. If nothing else, we're putting in the old college try. So. <laughs> well, and at least you've got the numbers to still like be an SSP, you know, yes. you're, you're, so, hang, you're hanging you know. on there. So that's mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, that's awesome. And you keep mentioning this, this small carnivore tag thing that you, you do these web series. And I was so bummed. I wanted to attend yesterday's <laughs> and then I, um, I was literally just reading a book and got super absorbed. <laughs> and I was like, I cannot forget that this thing is happening. And then it was 40 minutes late. Cause no, I was, and I was like, totally no, good. but you did say that they might be available like afterwards or something. Yes. So, so, so can you tell people recorded. how they can see this and everything? Yeah. So, um, unfortunately it's a little limited with who can watch them just because, um, of the zoo community and just making sure that people, um, I have been recording them for the purpose of building a husbandry course for small carnivore tag, but also posting them in um, the AZA website. They have a network, so it's kind of like um, kind of like Reddit for. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> really me. is. Yeah. It really it looks is. Like, yeah. It kind of is like Reddit where you can ask questions or yeah. different things um, and they have different threads. So I typically post them in the small carnivore area there. Um, so if you are a person that does not have access to AZA, but you know people that do, they can get on there and they can um, get the videos. So um, the reason I do that is just because of making sure that they're not falling into nefarious hands. No, I don't of course. Know. I, no, yeah, of course. It's, it's, it's of, very smart to do that. I mean, I'm very careful with these interviews for the same reason. Yeah, um, there are people who will, you know, misrepresent things. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I'm super proud of all the people that uh, contribute to the web series. So I wouldn't want to put them in a situation where they feel uncomfortable. They, um, they're in their facilities, gave consent to share these um, experiences. So I'm super grateful for that. But um, I have them all recorded. They were they were fun yesterday. We had a ton of technical issues, so we could have used you yesterday, probably. <laughs> um, but all of our presenters went through great information. We had some good questions. Um, we did training small carnivores in a old build, so a uh, tiger building that was built for larger animals and trying to navigate how to work FUSA and ocelots and 
uh, clouded leopards and how to work that in those spaces. So that was really cool, gave a lot of people awesome ideas for in the future for their old builds, because not everybody gets a brand new building that works as perfectly as you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also did Wolverine blood draw behavior. So um, that was super fun. Uh, we will have a Wolverine topic on the next one as well from the program leader. Um, he's going to do breeding introduction. So Wolverine just had a workshop in Columbus. So I was kind of like, hey, do you want to share some stuff with us? So they've been really stoked and really awesome to share. Um, we also did Blackfoot of Ferrets, radiographs, uh, voluntary radiographs, which was really fun to see. Since they're kind of a hands-off animal, it was cool to see them um, working them in that way. And then we did um, we did um, assisted rearing for meerkats. So we got to see lots of cute meerkat pictures. Nice. So. <laughs> they were very, very fun. And it was... Um, yeah, it was an awesome time, regardless of how many issues we had with cameras and mics and recordings. <laughs> oh, goodness. That's really cool. Yeah, I look forward to I'll have to check that out on the AZA uh, yeah. on, on the board there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and for anyone who's listening, if you are a member of the AZA and friendly reminder, you don't have to be at an AZA facility. You can just pony up some dough and become a member and learn things and support things and have access to all of this amazing stuff, which I think is is a really cool thing. I've been a member I think three years, four years now. And um, it's it's very cool to be able to be part of that community. So Plus yeah. you get discounts at zoos if you're a member. You do. <laughs> you do. Technically, actually, you're really at a lot of them. They'll, they'll, it, there's this weird thing. I've never talked about this on here. But if you're a member of AZA, not an AZA facility, yeah, like there is reciprocity. But AZA members are supposed to get in free at a lot of zoos. I get in free to a lot of zoos, which is super fun because I am an AZA member. <laughs> but I for like I've I tried it once or twice and the people at the front desk really seem to struggle with understanding and knowing that has been my yeah. experience. And yes. so usually I just use my reciprocal. It's like half off, whatever. But also since I started doing Ross Safari, I don't really pay to go to zoos very often anymore, which oh, is convenient. Friend. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I I'm, I'm good at making those connections. Even if I'm not right? doing an interview, I'm like, well, can you at least comp me? Yeah. Um, but no, but that is something that if you go to a lot of zoos and if you're willing to be patient with the, the people who maybe don't know, um, you know, you pay for one membership and you might not have to pay to go to any zoos for the year. Yeah, it is a really nice perk. Um, the only place I will say that it was tougher is San Diego because they do not do reciprocity. But if you're an AZA member, you do get a discount and it is expensive to go there. So. It is so expensive to go there. Um, I think it was 60 bucks a person. So, um, yeah, we got a discount and I was happy for it because either way I was going to go because I needed to see pandas in person. Yeah, but. yeah no, of course. Yeah, no, I um, yeah. I was I was playing out in L.A. Uh, for a while and, you know, it wasn't that far. I was on the, the San Diego side of L.A. Mm -hmm. And so it was like an hour, hour and a half, uh, probably hour and a half to get down to the San Diego Zoo. And I was there for like six weeks. So I, I got a membership. Mm -hmm. And it was like a $400 membership, but yeah. it was so worth it because like you said, it was like 60 bucks every time. And I was going yeah. a couple times a week and then, um, you can make it last. Yeah. yeah and you, you really also get it. some like, you know, member like, oh, you can have somebody come for free a couple times or whatever. And you and, get discounts in the gift shop. Yeah. And yeah. on like, be, you know, behind the scenes experiences and stuff. And so it actually worked out because then Zoe came over and, and, you know, flew over after my gig and we went a couple times. It was very worth it. But I was like, the fact that I'm buying a $400 Zoo membership and I'm like, this is going to save me so much I know. money. It does, and it, it really it did. Seems... It saved so much money. <laughs> So much. I went because I I think it was at least three times a week that I was at one of their two parks, sometimes oh, yeah. four. And like, yeah, you just you would blow. That's so much money. Plus the food and, and mer like you said, it's all it, it was very worth it. But when I bought it, I was like, this is insane. <laughs> I'm going to kick my other cat out real quick. Okay. I opened the door and two dogs come in. I was like, no, everybody's got to get out. <laughs> Do you ever find that when you go to your work at the zoo, it's easier because there are less animals there than at your home? <laughs> <laughs> In my routes, normally there are less animals than at my house. Yes. Um, they just all think that wherever I am is the coolest place in the world. So they need to also go and then 
uh, Fish just now was getting really bored. So then he's running around. And I was like, he's going to knock over something else. I need to just kick him out. That's so <laughs> funny. Well, to, to be fair, we are almost done here. But I do need oh, two yeah. last things from you, which, of course, yes. are your conservation organization you'd like to give a shout out to. Um, that is tough because we do Conservation Fusion, which is in uh, Madagascar. That is a supported Blank Park Zoo organization. Uh, they also work with Omaha. So that is one of my all-time favorites because of the awesome work that they do empowering the kids in Madagascar. Um, similar to what we talked about before, Madagascar is an extremely poor country. So anytime you can empower those people, I am down for that. And then um, my more local one would be the Duke Lemur Center. They do some awesome research. They do some awesome work and they are able to bring, I don't know, just the magic of lemurs to the people in the U.S. and I love it. And they are well-funded. They do a ton of research um, on ring-tailed lemurs specifically seem to get diabetes with large fruit diets. So they were able to get a ton of research from them. They do it on savakas. They do it on, you know, mongoose lemurs. They, they are really cool facility and I highly support uh, what they do as well. Yes, I love the Duke Lemur Center. I, I had um, Dr. Lydia Green on a couple times when she oh, was yeah. there. And then the, the last time was um, with, with her absolutely, you know, lovely wife, who is also a, a doctor who was there. And they just do, you know... Um, lemur stuff together and it's, I know, it's so and that's cool beautiful and, and I, I love, love it. them yeah marina and lydia are such great people um and then uh i actually just recently this is this is the fun part of my life sometimes doing this kind of thing i so you know they're not at the center anymore and i was like oh that's a bummer and i'd love to do an interview there sometime maybe talk to like somebody who's not in the research side as much but just in the lemur side and mm-hmm. i was just chilling on my couch one night and i get this message and it was a, a keeper and they were like hey so I know you're in North Carolina a lot. Have you ever thought of coming to see us at the Duke Lemur Center? And I'm like, well, hello there. <laughs> <laughs> hello, I would love to. <laughs> I was like, I am very excited about this. Because sometimes oh, I'll yeah. like, I'll email, like I know I emailed their PR team, but like emails go to spam sometimes or PR teams get busy sometimes or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it having that connection is like, oh, hello. Yes, we should I know, we should yeah. Chat. It's yes. always great when it's like, hey, are you going to be in this area? Cause I'd love for you to come and like go behind the scenes. And I'm like, oh, I can be in that area for that. Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm not. But on the other hand, how, yeah, how, how, you know, trip. Yeah, it's, only, <laughs> it's only Montana. How far could it be or whatever? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I have a free weekend, I like to try to travel to other zoos, especially zoos that represent FUSA. Cause I like to see what their setups are. I like to talk to their keepers. Um, I am very reachable on email as well. Um, but some people, they don't realize they have questions until you're standing right in front of them. And then they're like, well, we do this thing. What do you think about that? And I'm like, oh, well, if you want my opinion. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Very cool. And now it is time. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're going to laugh and say, oh, no. It's time for the Rossifari Poop Story. So I already gave you one earlier, but that wasn't very good. So. No, no, no. I expect um, more from you. Come on. <laughs> um, this is a thing that doesn't happen just once in a while. Um, this is a thing that happens to me <laughs> regrettably more than I it probably should. Um, <laughs> when we're feeding our sea lions, they will sometimes huff air and spit scales onto your face. Um, and... I was working with Ross for a demo and he kind of spit like a fish goober, like onto my hand. So (laughs) I was like, okay, like whatever. I have a glove on. It's fine. And then I went to do a hand cue and I flung it onto my face. Oh no! And I was just like, okay, don't act like anything happened because people are watching. And then I was just like, okay, just like wipe it off my face and like wipe it in the bucket. I was like, Oh my God. The whole time I'm like, it's fine. And then I did an exaggerated cue and just like flung it onto my face. And I was like, what are we doing? Why are we like this? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. Most of my stories are about fish recently because I just deal in a lot of fish. I mean, besides literally almost crying when walking into the cat buildings because of the urine smell, it's our meal. I mean, no one could confuse that wing to own be owned by anyone else besides deuce but (laughs) (laughs) 
he definitely dominates the cat building with his urine. So. Amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been so much fun. I need to get yeah. back to Blank Park. It's been too long. Oh, yes. Please let us know if you're coming. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, Brittany was an absolutely incredible guest, as I knew she would be, and I hope y'all took a lot from that interview. Um, speaking of which, uh, there's actually more. If you want to hear some additional content, uh, some additional conversation between Brittany and I, well, if you are a patron, you can do so. We talked about all kinds of stuff, and by all kinds of stuff, I mostly mean FUSA. And uh, so I have some of that set aside for my patrons. So if you want to become a patron of the podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Ross Safari, and then you'll get to listen to that bonus content and so much more. And I would like to say thank you to all of my patrons, especially my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Lara Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, Jenny Owens, and Kevin Williams. And uh, y'all, I think we've said enough. This is a long one. But hey, don't forget, the word credits backwards is Steiderk. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.